The event at the Capitol in early January, I think, stunned America. Uh, it was something that no one really thought would happen, and uh, it, uh, it did. And as a result of that, I think businesses, not only government, but businesses are really looking at their own operation to say, could that something that no, nobody ever thought could happen? Could that happen near me? Could it happen in my city? Could it happen at my asset? So I think what's happened now is people are really looking at their own internal procedures and protocols to see what could be done to hopefully eliminate it or, or prevent it, but certainly mitigate the impact of it should, it should it occur. Also, what's happened in the security industry is that security personnel are now looking at security companies as well as corporate security, in-house security operations are looking at their procedures uh, to look at and potentially add that to their emergency procedures. Do we have a procedure for a catastrophic event? Do we have a procedure where large amounts of crowds uh, could impact my asset? Over the last 12 months uh, since COVID and since the protests that have occurred uh, last summer um, related to uh, police activity, uh, we've seen an up rising or an up uptick of that type of protest demonstration uh, activity that normally we would not have seen. In the past, we've seen protests. Some of them have been related to a political event or an incident. A lot of them could have been labor related as well, or there's a union protest, that type of thing. Uh, it could be also a situation that occurred after a, a ball game or a win or some sort of large event that's uh, going on within a city or within an area. But obviously the last 12 months have been more concerning for security directors and property managers and corporate security professionals because of the volatility and uh, unfortunately some of the violence that goes with those type of events. So security personnel have been, I think, put on notice that we've got to be uh, prepared working with our partners and looking at our emergency procedures, making sure that the assets that we're protecting um, have the ability to close down in a short order. The other uh, aspect of this, uh, I think that is shown as been situational awareness. Uh, are the security personnel, are our clients reaching out to our law enforcement partners? Are we looking at social media feeds? Do we know what's happening within our city? Do we see any predictive, potentially predictive uh, trends that might let us know something might be happening? Uh, right now we're seeing a lot of intelligence from law enforcement pre-inauguration that there may be some violence in groups that are going to be going to Washington as well as other cities. So that's putting us as security professionals and our clients on notice to take a look at what have we heard from a chatter standpoint? What have we heard through our uh, associations? Uh, what have we heard through law enforcement channels specifically in our area that could give us an indication we should be ready? And even if we haven't, I think it's a good opportunity for property managers and security personnel to revisit their emergency procedures, particularly when it relates to large crowds or criminal events that uh, could be potentially occurring. And if even if they're not going to be, it's, it's, it's a wake up call for us to be prepared that in the event that does, that does happen, whether it's related to uh, the political climate of the country or other incidents that we are ready and we're able to prepare to respond in the event that that happens. But it's all about preparation. What are we doing to prepare for it? What are the likely scenarios? Uh, what type of training have we done for our officers and understanding the do's and don'ts of responding? What have our property managers have done in terms of, or uh, corporate security partners have done to help prepare? What are the vulnerabilities of that particular building or site or company uh, to things like uh, targets that could be targeted or buildings or, or, or companies that could be targeted by protesters? Uh, are they ne near public transportation where a lot of the Folks that are protesting typically will use public transportation, and if you're across the street from that, may not be targeting your building, but it could impact because of that traffic flow. So these are all things that, uh, that need to be uh, addressed and considered. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all about that frontline security personnel because they're the ones that are gonna be here 24 seven. They're in the lobbies, they're patrolling. So they're really the eyes and ears of the property. So we have to train them in understanding what to do. And I think most importantly, the safety of those officers making sure that their role is not to interact with those uh, individuals, but to retract into the building, to call 911, to keep it under surveillance. And at Secure America, we have very comprehensive developed protocols and training for our officers in how not to engage, what to do if violence does occur. 
We also work with our property managers and uh, other customers, our security directors, as well as our uh, corporate partners to work with them in addressing and uh, reviewing their protocols. And those protocols not only are uh, involving security, but looking at their vendors, their parking, uh, their uh, other vendors that they use, their cleaning crews, their landscaping crews, because those are all uh, force multipliers in terms of looking at what's going on. Uh, that's all part of, I think, the overall process of looking at, 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 at these type of events and, and preparing for them. Uh, I think also what's important is the physical security uh, components of, of a particular building. Can we quickly lock doors? Uh, do the tenants and employees of a building uh, are they being communicated with either by security or the company uh, to keep them in knowing real-time threat information? This is happening or this is happening down the street. They need to be prepared. And if it does happen, what are they supposed to do? What are the protocols? What are we going to do to lock the building up? Uh, are there safe areas for security to go to in the event that a building is breached? These are things that we would probably not think of years ago, but we have to think about now. And I think at the end of the day, we want to keep people safe. We want to be respectful to everybody. And at the same time, as a security provider, we want to really be an asset protection risk management partner with our clients. What would you say to a um, uh, property manager that might not have you know, created a emergency preparedness plan or might not have reviewed one in, um, um, in a while? You know, how would they get started? What would be your suggestions for uh, if they haven't done something about this in a while, but they really now know they need to? If a property manager or a client representative, it could be really not just property management, it could be a corporate uh, representative, has not developed a, an emergency response plan, certainly now is the time to do so. There are a lot of resources that are out there. Uh, first of all, talking to their insurance carrier, uh, talking to not only their insurance broker, but the carriers that provide general liability insurance. They have a lot of great templates. A lot, of our, uh, a lot of associations that our clients will be belonging to, as an example, if it's a property manager, the Building Owners and Managers Association, BOMA. BOMA International is a terrific uh, uh, place to find. They've already developed standards and protocols and have a lot of resources that a property manager can, can use. Uh, also partnering uh, with a security provider, uh, Secure America. We uh, partner quite uh, intimately with our uh, with our property managers and other customers to sit down with them uh, well ahead of an event, but on a certainly on an annual basis to review the, the security procedures from our perspective. But there's more to an emergency plan than just security procedures. There's other things that a property manager needs to know. Uh, the other area that I would look at is what are the threats specifically to a city or around a, an area. Uh, the other area I would suggest the property manager do is contact their colleagues the building across the street. Uh, there's a lot of meetings that go on, not only BOMA meetings, but uh, security association meetings that the property manager should be involved with so they know what's going on. But I think by looking at all of those sources and, and even just going on the internet to looking at some basic plans that they could use. ASIS International, American Society for Industrial Security, uh, is a leader in providing that information. So certainly as is international, uh, looking at that website, talking to associations as well, they have some great materials as well as does the federal government in providing good guidance. Uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, is another great, uh, great area of focus that uh, can be used as a best practice for a property manager or really anybody in developing comprehensive plans. The plans, though, need to be, execute, they need to be executable. It's easy to have a big binder uh, showing all of, this, all of these uh, Word documents on what to do. It, it really has to be a plan that can easily be executable, meaning that if we had a call right now that something was happening, immediately we could, we could utilize that plan. Because if it's just a document just to appease an insurance company that's never used, it's never tested, uh, there's no roles and responsibilities, um, it's just a, a doorstop. And we've seen that happen. So it's a plan that has to be certainly uh, done in a way that all of the people that are responsible for executing it know their role, know what to do. Uh, you've done tabletops, meaning you've given scenarios in a room to people to say, what happens if this happens? Is it a bomb threat? Is it a fire? Is it a medical emergency? Is it a power failure? Is it a protest? Uh, or is it a criminal act? Uh, what, how are the stakeholders associated with that particular account? And when we say stakeholders, tenants, employee groups, vendors, how are they all going to interact, not siloed, but together in responding and preparing for a situation? If you think about a potential demonstration 
uh, in stages, you know, having a pre-event, an event, and a post-event. Let's talk about each of the stages a little bit. So in a pre-event, you know, kind of in your mind, what's most important? You know, if you're aware that something's going to happen in your city, a demonstration or a protest or anything like that, what, what are some of the kind of key things you should do, you know, before the event? There are different levels to events. You have a pre-event situation where you may be given information that, as we have right now, that there could be, or there's intelligence to indicate that there could be protest, demonstration, civil unrest, uh, or any type of associated disturbance or cr criminal act that could be coming to a particular city. And that may be broad, it's maybe the whole city, it could be targeted to certain areas. But even with that, even if a property manager doesn't think their building could potentially be in that area, they still should think about it. We had, uh, we had unrest in, in Atlanta, Georgia last year uh, that we did not think it would spread to some of the areas that it did. So in a pre-event situation where there's been an event, a political event, uh, or some other incident that has occurred that, that, that may indicate that there could be some uh, protest or demonstration, it could be peaceful. But sometimes what can happen in a crowd situation is you can have agitators that are going to edge people on or they themselves take it upon themselves to engage in criminal acts. Because just because it's a protest demonstration doesn't mean that all of those people associated with it, 99, 90%, 95% of those people are going to protest peacefully. But if you have agitators that are in there, they could uh, cause that to go in a different direction. So from a pre-event standpoint, make sure that your plans are in place. You've tested that. Uh, you've got vendors there that in the event that, that there is damage to the property, such as broken windows, you've got your vendors all lined up. You might even be able to stage plywood ahead of time if you know that something is going to happen that you have. In the event, you have to quickly, uh, as the event maybe moves toward your building, or just in here in Atlanta, we've seen uh, already and in other major cities, uh, they've already seen boarded up windows and that type of thing to protect the property. So pre-event, you've got to know, you know what's going on, what the threats are, but you've got to be prepared in the event that that event actually occurs. Then during the event, uh, you need to monitor what's going on with the event. Uh, where is the crowd? Where is it going? Um, are there any more specific threats? If you see them now incurring more closely to the property, uh, then you have to take on more uh, restrictive uh, responses. Uh, if it's during the daytime, obviously letting tenants know what's going on, giving them real-time information about what's happening with the event, making sure security understands that, that they're ready, uh, and then ready to close off the building if necessary and shelter in place in some cases if it gets uh, to that point. Um, the event occurs, uh, the key is safety, is making sure that the security personnel, the building occupants, uh, even your vendors are, are put in a safe place because we can always take care of the property damage after. If it does occur, we can't uh, uh, save somebody's life if somebody actually gets involved where there is a death or serious injury. Post-event, post-event clearly is looking at what did we do right, what did we do wrong, what are the lessons that we learned, what are some of the things that we need to build into this after the fact. Uh, and then working with your colleagues in the city, getting debriefs from law enforcement and your other colleagues, whether that's a, a, another building, another client, another property, to say, okay, what could we have done collectively? What could we have done to maybe work with each other better? And then having a, a, that in, in, a, in a written format, bringing your people together associated with your key tenants and stakeholders, your, your security personnel, uh, your vendors and, and your uh, engineers, uh, your custodial staff, et cetera, in saying, okay, what can we do to prevent and how do we make that plan mo more robust and more successful the next time? Because it is a learning situation. There's always gonna be room for improvement and that's the key. Those are very important things to do because in the event that there is an injury, uh, I can almost guarantee you there'll be litigation or at least a, an insurance claim against you. You wanna be prepared. So that's why working with your broker, working with your general liability carer, very key to let them review that, give them feedback as well. Also corporate attorneys, making sure their your, your legal staff is involved in it to make sure that you're well protected because I always say uh, litigation uh, it could occur, but be prepared that it will occur. And I think that gives you an opportunity to hopefully, if it does occur, you, you're in a much more defensible position from a premises liability standpoint, uh, because all of that's been thought about ahead of time. And that's why when you do the debrief, that's part of it too, getting those people involved in it to say, what could we have done? And what could be the potential that there could be a claim brought against us to get ready for that if it does occur? Do you uh, think that buildings are more susceptible to risk in this new COVID environment 
um, uh, when it comes to civil protests and demonstrations? I think the COVID environment certainly has elevated the concern that property managers have from a risk perspective. Uh, if you think about COVID, not only the health concerns, we'll take that off the table, that's a whole other discussion, but from a physical security standpoint, the building still needs to be protected. Typically in a building now, you have uh, less occupants. Um, in some cases, because you have less occupants, sometimes building security protocols have increased. So now they're, they're, they're operating that building at, as if off hours versus normally if it was pre or post COVID when you have an open building and most buildings are, you have people that can come in and out pretty, pretty freely and go up in an elevator. Uh, now, uh, a lot of our clients have uh, asked that the uh, building be more restrictive uh, because you have maybe 10, 20% of the occupants now that are in that building. That also helps us because it's security personnel, we can't, if we have a building that has hundreds and thousands of people going in and out of it. There is no way our security personnel will recognize everybody. Uh, in a COVID environment where it is much more closed building, or even if it's an open building, we, we, we get to know those people that are coming in and out. It, it actually will help from a security standpoint. Um, we have not seen an elevation, at least from our customers, where criminal activity has increased in our buildings. What we have seen in cities is an elevation of criminal activity post-COVID. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, that uh, people that normally would be out there uh, uh, are staying at home, and unfortunately the criminal element have, has used that as an opportunity to uh, engage in more criminal activity. Here in Atlanta, we've seen a 400% uh, in, increase in crime since last year. Uh, murders, uh, shootings, uh, criminal activity such as uh, car break-ins, uh, thefts, uh, that type of thing, uh, that's very concerning. Uh, in fact, Secure America right now is working with the Atlanta Police Department, Atlanta Police Foundation, and putting a collaborative effort together between pro private and public security to see what we can do to increase uh, the visibility of security personnel uh, in the buildings that we're, where we can actually go outside and provide a little bit more visibility. Uh, they're going to be adding more police as well. But company-wide, I say, I'm saying, I'm sorry, countrywide, law enforcement is under a tremendous challenge. We are seeing uh, an elevation of resignations, voluntary resignations. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, a decrease in recruiting efforts because pol people don't want to be police officers anymore. What that is creating is a more reliance on private security to supplement those efforts because public safety right now is, um, in many cities, they're, they're overrun. Uh, a lot of crimes are going on, criminal activity, police officers are, are being stretched. Even dispatchers uh, are, are, are not wanting to, to work for a police department. Turnover is there as well. So all that complicates the COVID environment with the protests and demonstrations that we're seeing in the country. Um, if you're a property manager or an asset manager, there were some things you should look for to your uh, security provider or clues that that security provider is prepared uh, for demonstrations and civil unrest um, uh, type of activities or signs that they're not prepared, maybe another way of asking it. Property managers need to talk to their security providers prior to any major protest activity. Again, the last month or so, particularly the last couple of weeks here in the country, we've been given warnings and expectations from law enforcement that protests are going to occur in all of our cities, particularly in the capitals. Uh, that doesn't mean it's just going to be centered on the capitol buildings. It could also migrate to other uh, areas of a particular city. Uh, property managers should get with their security providers, sit down and ask them, what are you doing to prepare your officers? What type of training have they had? Uh, what type of people are you bringing into my building so that we can hopefully mitigate and minimize any type of incident that occurs? Uh, that's number one. Number two would be to ask that security provider, what can you do to help us prepare? What are some of the things that you can provide us with? How can you help us with situational awareness? What type of alerts? Uh, what type of chatter are you listening to? What is your relationship to the public safety agencies, federal, state, and local? That's very key. If a security provider says, well, gee, we don't have those relationships, that's kind of a, not a response you want to hear. You want to have a security provider understand that they're a partner for you not only in, in providing the security within the building itself, but also listening to what's going on around the area and providing that data. That could be crime information, that could be information on protest, intelligence from uh, the local uh, police department, 
uh, and also finding out from them what are you doing to actively get involved with public safety? Uh, do you belong to any security associations in the area? Do you have your security director uh, working with other security directors? Are you on type? Are you on a type of board or committee that meets on a regular basis to discuss uh, incidents that are going on? That's all uh, a part of the value add that you should be getting from your security provider, and not just providing uh, the officers to fill the posts. Do you think that with what's going on? Um, particularly leading up to the inauguration. Um, do you think security companies are in a better situation in today's day and age than they were in the past to be able to proactively prepare for these kind of things? I think what we're seeing in the climate, I don't want to say a silver lining, lining because there is really none when we look at what's happened in this country, particularly over the last couple of months and, and year with all of the things that we've all been through. But I think what the events have done to the security companies and security profession overall is making them much more better prepared, understanding that these threats are real and getting them to be in a better place, uh, hiring better people, uh, training them better, partnering with their clients better. I think this has helped to bridge the gap between a property manager or uh, a company and its security provider. I think we're seeing a lot more collaborative effort, which is great. Uh, I think that these efforts have done that. Uh, these incidents have done that. It's kind of forced that, uh, that that has happened. The other thing that this has done is it also has helped bridge the gap between public safety and private. That public safety, police agencies, law enforcement agencies now are relying much more on private security. Private security is also reaching out to the pu uh, public sa safety agencies to say, give me some information, help us help you. And that's, I think, a very, very, very positive trend.